Akul is a director of new product introduction group in Applied Materials. He has been at Applied Materials for over 12 years now, leading multiple teams in engineering and operations, both with semiconductor and display markets. Alongside technical le leadership, his great passion is in organization's culture of inclusion and employee growth, where he is partnering and leading multiple programs at India and global level. Welcome, Akul. Our next panel member is Devika, Devika Nair from Allegis. Uh, Devika heads the DNI and CSR, CSR responsibilities for Allegis Group in India. She heads the flagship DNI programs to create inclusive workspaces, especially for women and persons with disability and members of pride community within the organization, as well as for the clients. Welcome, Devika. Our next panel member is Gopi Mohan Venukopa from LSCG. Hailing from God's own country, Kerala State in India, Gopi Mohan Venugopal is a service improvement manager and global colleague for the Accessibility Network India operations at LSEG. With over 12 years of diverse industry experience in various domains such as art and photography, hospitality, content production, learning and development, and service exploration, Gopi is skilled at managing global projects while building relationships across various groups and teams. Welcome, Gopi. I'm inviting the next panel member, Shobha Shaji from Dusters Total Solution Services Private Limited. Shobha is a charismatic HR practitioner and leader uh, with over 20 years of transitional experience in people practices, uh, operational experience, and intervention across multiple business environments. At DPSS, Shobha is responsible for envisioning the HR roadmap, reimagining the company culture. Uh, defining people-centric strategies, operational priorities aligned with organizational goals for delivery excellence. Welcome, Shiva. <laughs> Next, I invite Sridhar Kulshekaran from Amazon. Sridhar has 25 plus years of experience across research, product engineering, solution delivery and entrepreneurship. Currently, he is the director of retail business services, RBS, uh, 6,000 plus organizations of 11 countries supporting Amazon's global retail uh, business. Sridhar is uh, a part of Amazon's team and champions the DNI and PWP initiative. Welcome Sridhar. Uh, our final panel member of today is Stephen McInnes from Sin Jeans. Stephen is the founder and CEO of Sin Jeans Media Private Limited, a VFX uh, animation and media and advertising studio. During his 17 years journey, he delivered over 40 conversion projects, including Ant-Man, Avengers, uh, Age of Ultron, Guardians of the Galaxy, International 3D Trans Winner, Transformer, Transformers Age of uh, Extinction, and Star Wars Episode 1, 2, 3. Uh, as the head of the production film for Prime Focus in India, he worked on some of the biggest blockbusters in Bollywood, including Blue and Johnny Jockey China. Welcome, you see. Now, gentlemen, are my Nagyupa, the CEO of Enable India Solutions. Hello. So, over the course of the last two days, we've been hearing a lot uh, from both uh, from people with disabilities, their journey, their experiences. Uh, and uh, But the circle, as we know, is incomplete unless we hear it even from uh, the employers. Uh, often we hear that, uh, you know, people have approached organizations, applied people with disabilities, but companies are wary of hiring them. And the reasons are manifold. Some of them uh, uh, look at accessibility, some of them uh, cite reasons of approval, or uh, they just don't know whether their staff are ready to uh, have people with disabilities on board, and the reasons go on and on. 
But today we have here leaders from organizations that have done stellar work in terms of uh, bringing in uh, disability to the workplace. And I think uh, the time is right to hear from them to understand uh, what are the best practices. The journey has not been easy for them. They've had their share of challenges, but they have made great uh, uh, efforts and uh, uh, brought in uh, inclusion uh, to the workplace. So without further ado, getting into uh, the discussion, I know that uh, we are a little delayed uh, to get in right. So I want to start with you, uh, Sridhar. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, Amazon is huge, you have a large number of verticals, and um, it, it's simply amazing that, uh, you know, you are uh, spread from uh, a technology, uh, 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 the uh, internet, to basic warehousing operations, a huge supply chain. And we hear a lot about uh, people with disabilities uh, across operations. Just wanted to understand uh, how this journey has happened. Uh, what is the role that leadership has had to play at Amazon, and uh, in terms of uh, bringing about, uh, you know, making the employees understand, uh, see the value in inclusion across levels. Thank you, Vinaya. Um, have to step back. Uh, one of the things is uh, we look at uh, inclusion as a business imperative, not something that we do as a CSR or not something that we do because it's a good thing to do. Um, Amazon has a customer first culture and if we don't have the right representation of our customers across our board, I think we are missing out as a business. So CSR is a business imperative for us, sorry, uh, diversity is a business in, uh, imperative for us and PWD is one of our primary Pillars. So, with that customer first attitude, what we have done is uh, we have a India leadership team, and uh, the India leadership team has sponsors for each of the uh, pillars that we want to focus on uh, on the diversity firm. And PWD is the pillar that I personally focus on. Uh, coming to your question on how do we develop it, we have two, uh, in, in Amazon, it's almost everything uh, drives around are uh, leadership principles, tenets, and mechanisms. Uh, leadership principles guide us what to do and how to take a decision when we are presented with a challenge. The tenets for uh, any particular program that we run decides how to execute on the program. And finally, mechanisms is what we use to ensure the program is sustainable and sees and achieves the desired results. So that's the uh, uh, modus operandi for Amazon and it's common for almost everything that we do. It's not just for uh, this particular initiative or that particular initiative. It stems from our core business principles and that's how we run our business, that's how we run our programs and that's how we run our PWD as well. Thank you Shrita, that's been uh, insightful. Uh, moving on to you Akul. Uh, we just heard from Shrita and for Amazon it's not been a recent journey, they've been uh, through it for over a decade now. But when AMAT Applied Materials got into this journey, pretty recently, in fact, it was during the uh, pandemic. And that was a time when most organizations were actually putting hiring on freeze, especially uh, disabled hiring. Uh, so if you could take us through how that journey has been for you all and uh, uh, what were the challenges you faced and how did you address them? Sure, man. So as you rightly said, right, uh, our journey started just when the pandemic was starting, but actually the thought process started a little earlier, right? And as we all are talking uh, in the industry, right? Taking the first step is is not that easy, right? It's, there are a lot of bureaucracies, there are a lot of challenges, there are a lot of questions get asked, right? But uh, we were very uh, fortunate and thankful to the leadership in Applied Materials India that it took some time, but we were able to take uh, those first steps. And uh, to be honest, at the starting, we were very enthusiastic. Uh, we wanted to do everything, and we thought it's a walk, right? It's it's very easy to do. We just have to put efforts. We just have to put the budget, money, and it will be done. 
and that's where uh, we started engaging with you guys at Enable India, right? And uh, you guys first came to our campuses, and the actual transition of the thought process happened when we visited you guys first, and that was just before pandemic. Fortunately, February 2020, that we visited your facility, and it totally changed our perception. Uh, we we came to know that. There are a lot of things that we don't know as an organization. And that's where we, we need to learn. The learning curve can't be exponential. It has to be a slow learning curve. And that's how we need to approach. And of course, we, we were committed. Uh, we were very excited that we want to take these steps. And we were, of course, selfish. That, that's the first thing that comes to my mind, right? When somebody says that this is a CSR, this is to support PWDs, no, this is to support companies. This is an untapped talent pool that the companies can use. And you can grow by using that talent pool. So that's that's what our thought process was when we started. And uh, as, as we learned from you guys, we again didn't take drastic steps to start with it. We took an initiative to do a proof of concept, a kind of pilot, right? And that pilot was not to test out PWD candidates, that was to test out ourselves. That are we ready, what we need to learn, what we need to do to really be able to do the right things. And it took us a lot of time, right? It took us uh, that hiring, as you were saying that that was during pandemic, we had to learn how to do virtual interviews, uh, different kind of disabilities, uh, need different kind of solutions if they have to attend the virtual interviews, right? So all those things happened and then uh, thanks to Enable India, we, we had a lot of feedback mechanism. We were constantly doing peer sensitization, management sensitization, right? All those things in parallel and then we had hiccups. And that is another thing, right? We hired a first candidate and he left in a month. But you have to think that that can happen with any candidate. That's not really specific to PW. That you have to take it as any hiring. So that's something that our company was very, very committed to. And we, we hired the person, we hired more. And then when we took on the journey of those six, nine months after the hiring, right, that's where we realized, okay, now we have a little bit of understanding to move forward. That's where we expanded to uh, other part of our company. And we started sensitizing other uh, managers, other PUs, other organizations within applied materials, and that the journey took off. And then, in past years, we we now have done a lot of exercises. Uh, this recently, or uh, rather, on Friday itself, we have concluded our first upskilling program. Uh, I will talk about it a uh, little uh, more about that later, but. Uh, now we are doing kind of a three-way uh, ecosystem creation. Uh, one is one part of it is universities. The second part of it is is uh, our ecosystem partners, and the third part of it is of course government. And uh, we are basically based out a majority of us in Bangalore. So we work very closely with the government of Karnataka. Uh, we are working with uh, the bureaucrats there, trying to realize how how we can create that ecosystem. It's, it's not our uh, industry, it's not only government, it's not only a uh, section of uh, the people that can bring the change. It has to be a 360 degree change and that's that's what basically uh, we have learned. And internally also we, we are now doing a lot of uh, PWD events, different kind of it. it. It can be a fun event also. They are involved now in our cultural events. Right. We are not calling it separately anything, it's it's just normal. It's it's becoming a culture. It is it is not something that, that is special or different. So that part of it with the journey we have to uh, take those steps to reach that stage. So that's that's what we are trying to do right now. So I heard something uh, very interesting there. You spoke about the fact that it was not so much about uh, preparing to get, uh, you know, not so much about the person with disability, but preparing your own organization, uh, the environment and the people to uh, include disability. 
So building on that, Gopi, I wanted to understand, you know, we talk about uh, bringing in people with disability, but a lot of times uh, an organization's own employees could be people with uh, invisible disabilities. And uh, the London Stock Exchange Group has been very uh, active in uh, 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 addressing this difficult area. And, uh, you know, it's not easy for current or potential employees to come forward and talk about uh, the uh, disabilities that they have. So how has LSCT created an environment where employees feel comfortable to open up and uh, talk about, uh, open up and come forward and identify their uh, issues and work with, uh, you know, uh, the staff? Thanks, Anand. Um, it has been challenging. It is challenging. I, I think it's for challenging thing to achieve, right? Um, something which we, which I believe and which my company also believes is that it has to start from the top and eventually flow down to the bottom. What we generally do is we ensure or we encourage leaders to come out openly and talk about their challenges, talk about their difficulties in facing certain things and approaching certain things and make sure that people who are, who have a disability feel comfortable to open up. Now, declaration has always been a, a huge challenge and there are many countries where it's illegal to ask if you, if you have a disability or not. And um, we don't have an exact number. We, we, we tell people if, you, if you're open to telling it, please do disclose it. If you're not, that's perfectly fine. And we try addressing this through various activities, speaker sessions. We try getting a bit creative and have flow walks and um, highlight what invisible disability is. Now, I have dyslexia and sharing a very interesting story to support my argument. So recently we had um, a very a fun interactive session and I came up and I was talking about my challenges with dyslexia, my struggle with dyslexia and I was, I was telling them about why... So, interesting fact, fun fact about me. Um, anytime I walk around between meetings, um, when I meet people, I always have a earphone in my head. And that's because from my childhood, I've always had trouble with numbers. So I measure time through songs. So about six songs is half an hour for me, uh, 12 songs is about one hour for me, 12 to 13 songs is one hour for me. So I always walk around with a earphone in my head. And uh, I sometimes just dance a little bit and move around. So I, while I'm uh, working, if I'm listening to music, I may as well have some fun. So I, I spoke about this very openly. After the event, I came out. Um, this is a gentleman who came up to me and said, can I please hug you? And uh, it, was, it was very overwhelming. And then he just opened up and said, I'm dyslexic too. And I've never been able to come out about it. And it's really nice to hear leaders talk about it and be very transparent and acknowledge that it's fine to be different, right? And he just told me, like, right, you know what, for a long time, I used to think that you were just a weird, funny person walking around in the hall. And it's, it's a privilege. It's, it's something which I find um, as a great uh, compliment, to be honest. So it's, it's all about um, setting yourself as an example. So I think that's amazing. And what we also learned today is one more uh, accessibility uh, workplace sort of solution where you use songs to keep track of time. Um, so, uh, going on the same thing, uh, uh, I mean, we all uh, have heard of organizations, okay, so they want to bring on disability at the workplace, but then everybody uh, starts by saying, give me the tried and tested ones. How many of us know of organizations which have hired a, a team of their blind? So, Shropa, if you could take us through the experience of because you all have done uh, a team of best time and what that been like. And how did you all prepare yourselves for uh, this experience? Hello? Hello? Thanks, Sonia. Uh, first of all, it's lovely to be here. Unless you land here, you don't know how amazing this photo is. Um, our journey with disability has been similar. You know, we are basically in a blue color workspace. I have about 40,000 blue, blue collar employees to look after. For us, disability was something that would come as lowest in the priority of things. 
we should thank uh, Shanti Pina say no to Shanti. And she started this uh, the Vision 500 program and that's how we thought rather than outsourcing CSR by just giving funds, let's start working actively by insourcing and you know taking responsibility. And that's how we made our small steps uh, towards inclusivity. <coughs> and initially, uh, Vinaya we work only has you say, would say intellectually challenged, where we felt confident that we could train and place them across you know, corporates that we service. Um, so we have about 200 plus people now, but thanks to corporates like Alibis has some people, um, uh, Amazon has, Cisco has. So we are able to work with partners uh, because we are, uh, so we are actively well able to train and outsource them. But you know, um, the whole journey started when we personally invested our time in it. The initial program was run by Shamshir and me. Shamshir is the head of our organization. So we personally used to look at how is the person doing, has he been trained, how is his learning, uh, is he ready to be placed. And I think every organization is finding its way here. I heard about amazing things, uh, you know, earlier. And what we figured out is that you know we were this uh, we were in the spot where we could be like incubators or the you know uh, internship school where people could come to us. Um, and most importantly, more than skills, I think what they needed to learn was the socialization, the fear of meeting strangers and the fear of being accepted. <coughs> And it was not an easy journey. And the last batch we took on from India, mm -hmm. the deaf and blind kids, I was not too sure. Thanks to your strength, we took them on. I was not even sure how they would find their way. But I think the work skills program prepared them for that. But a whole lot of sensitization on the ground and peer sensitization. And as this is, as all of us agree, I think once leadership endorses uh, the program, once we invest our time. You know, people down the line look at it something as important and prestigious. I think that's been one of the reasons why I've been successful. But uh, having said that, uh, you know, when you have to create soft foods, you know, you have to create buddies, uh, and you have to uh, very important to help people understand what is accepted and uh, behavior in Tokyo, for instance. In this bunch of uh, deaf and blind students, there was a, uh, a boy who actually broke up a whole lot of broccoli. Now, typically, a pantry boy, you know, freaks out because he he get penalized. So it took my HR manager to tell me it's okay, it's okay if he does it, don't worry about it. And or, or then transition him to some other role where he, you know, he or she does that role very well. And uh, you know, if I take feedback, my team tells me that you don't have to supervise these kids. They are super dedicated and uh, they are very disciplined. They, what they do, they do very well. So I think, uh, you know, for, it's really not a uh, disability, it's uh, basically identifying the potential and being able to use them wherever we can. And I think organizations should find that space as to where can we apply ourselves. We don't have to be necessarily, because in example, we don't have to be necessarily the largest corporate which can run very big programs. But I think, uh, you know, we find it very good feeling that we're able to run this small internship batches of eight, 10 people out placing them. And, you know, they're still in the pipeline. And they keep coming and going. And the most important, thing is that our employees are also learning to be valuable and these are simple people who bring transformation. A simple 12th graduate boy, even 12th standard boy or not a graduate person, you see them, how they accept these programs and how they can be part of this transformation. For us that has been the learning. It has been uh, very um, challenging but I am glad that we went that mile and we have learned that we can do it. Thanks to Shanti and Elizabeth. There was an interesting point that you made there about socialization, about uh, the candidates to be comfortable with strangers. Uh, one of the biggest barriers that we all know towards inclusion is the fact that uh, the fear of strangers or something strange is not just with a person with disability. In fact, uh, the people without disabilities are also scared of the unknown when they interact with a person with disability. So taking that into consideration, Devika, Amit, how have you all prepared the staff in terms of uh, open to the idea of inclusion? Uh, thanks, Manaya. Um, and honestly, lovely hearing from all the panel members as well. For us, the key honestly has been uh, volunteering. Uh, it has, uh, as you rightly said, right, it's not it's not that there's an ill intent that people don't want to support, but a lot of us have not had the exposure. Um, and how do you kind of then get away from that barrier is by giving that required exposure to your uh, staff members. 
So for us, what's worked very well is integrating our sensitization programs, exposure to the community through our volunteering projects. So approximately 3,000 plus hours that we spend in an year on an average, uh, 70 to 80 percent of it would go in say resume preparations, interview preparations, um, playing cricket, uh, doing activities with the community because the minute you start engaging with the community, your barriers kind of start going down and that is what is required. Um, I know a lot of you have kind of gotten the exposure through this festival. Uh, this is the exact same model that you need to now replicate within your own organization. So I hear and uh, you know the organizers can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there are about a thousand volunteers that it took about a thousand volunteers to run the entire event for Purple Fest last one or two months put together. You have sensitized that entire batch of thousand people on disability inclusion. It's as simple as that. The minute they start interacting, their own barriers start coming down. They start seeing the value that they are able to add to the organization, you know, have fun conversations about sports, media, news, anything. Uh, it helps them kind of also start understanding how can we bring them into our system. So that has really helped kind of bring our culture and it's kind of driven now in the DNA. Um, we are trying to now institutionalize this further. Uh, there is a little brainchild here uh, of Shanti that's kind of, you know, we were talking about purple credits and how do we kind of institutionalize volunteering in a way that it's not ad hoc anymore. But people who get out of, you know, experiencing something are able to also reflect and see what is it that it's done to them. What value add has it brought to them and how is it that they can kind of take that back to their own work. So several small things like these have really helped us kind of create. We've not done a lot of uh, sensitization workshops as such. So nobody has gone to the boardrooms and done programs because um, there's only so much of... Uh, attention span during these L&D programs sometimes. Putting them in exposure uh, environment with the community has really done the wonders for us. Thank you, Devika. So, Stephen, just building on that, you have a large team of uh, people with hearing disabilities on your uh, team. What is the role that you have hired them for? So, uh, my company does visual effects. Uh, this was something which I have been exploring for a very long time. Uh, I was working for a much larger organization, Prime Focus. I'm sure you would have watched a lot of movies. Uh, Mask was last one, the big movie that Double Negative produced. You know, so in fact, some of these uh, kids that we trained, they actually worked on the master. You know, so we started this program. We started this program in 2018. Uh, so when I was hiring, I was I a senior VP there. When I was hiring, I saw, you know, when we hired, I suddenly went on the floor and I noticed that there were a couple of people who were deaf, but they had applied to the job, they had, you know, got through the interviews, they had got to the test and everything, and they actually got hired. We never even, you know, noticed them as people who were disabled at that time. And there were very few candidates with this. So that was the first time when I actually came you know, interacting with people who were disabled and they were actually doing a good job uh, of doing VFX. Later, we converted this into a full-fledged program. So, I toyed the idea with getting a few very, very general people who didn't even know computer. And uh, we we were actually in touch with La Monet Skills, who was talking to Enable. Uh, and they came, you know, with a, with a bunch of kids and said, uh, these are actually people who don't even know computer. So we said, okay, let's figure out how to train them. I spoke to my management, they liked the idea. I said, look, this is something that's going to cost. They were open to it and we started. The initial days were really tough because we had to teach them right to the basics, you know. And we had to also learn interpretation. So we hired an interpreter along with them. And, uh, you know, that person became part of the training session. We had about 15 kids. But even before getting these kids onto the training program, I could convince a whole bunch of parents to understand what we were really doing because visual effects is a different world. You know, you can't see what we can explain. We can only show them videos and say, your kid will do something like this. They will produce this kind of work. 
once they learn, but the learning curve is long. It's going to take at least six to eight months to learn the tools on what you need to create that kind of work. We started, we had some parents come two months later, come and talk to us and say, you've changed the life of my child. Someone who didn't even want to walk out of the house today, walks with pride, comes, wants to learn and wants to learn more. And that was the beginning. So we trained the first batch of 15. They actually graduated with good results. But I incentivized and I said, I'm not going to put you onto the floor. You're going to have to find me another 15 who will come on board. Ah. All right? And you will train those guys. And unless and until those guys aren't trained, you will not go to the floor. <laughs> and that became an incentive itself. That became organic. You know, people were actually training people who were disabled. And I didn't have to do much after that. You know, it just became a cycle. And believe it or not, the lockdown happened after that and everything went, you know, kaput. But post that, when Brahmastra actually started, people were actually working from home and these kids were also contributing from remote, you know, workstations sitting at home. And there were ways that people discovered on how to communicate with these guys. It was only messaging and, you know, texting more than having verbal conversations because that was difficult. So imagine 30 people sitting at home, working at different places and trying to communicate with their supervisor, with their lead and trying to understand what needs to be really done on the job and deliver that sitting at home. You know, that was also made possible. Post that, back to you know, me starting my own company, I made that a part of my vision statement that yes, 50% of my staff will be So from 2018, I set up my own company. Canadian VFX. We started very small with eight. We grew that company. I again approached the idea with different NGOs. So I went to ADAP, which is uh, the Spastic Society of India, which is now called ADAP, Able, Disabled, People Together. And uh, I spoke to them, I said, look, I have this idea, but they said, why don't you all come yourself and you know talk to the people there and tell them what you really want to do. So I went there and I, I thought, you know, I'll make a nice, you know, wonderful presentation. I made a nice PowerPoint and I said I'll talk to them and show them, you know, great visuals and they'll understand everything that I'm talking. But when I walked in there, I was shocked and I was wondering how am I even going to translate this whole idea and explain to these kids what I'm already talking about because they were all with different disabilities. And some of them were with cerebral palsy, with autism, you know, learning disorders. And I had their parents also sitting in the group. But yes, when I started, I didn't even, I shut the presentation and everything and I just started talking. And I said, look, this is what I do. I showed them some visuals of some movies, some making of some movies. And while I was showing them those visuals and they were like, oh, that's, you know, Salman Khan. Oh, that's Hrithik Roshan. Oh, that's Jai Ho. That's Bai, you know. So when they started talking about those visuals, that got me more excited. So I said, okay, that's something more. I showed them more visuals. I bombarded them with a lot more. And at the end of it, I just asked them, I said, how many of you would like to work on these and try to make these reality? And I had almost everybody jumping onto the idea. You know? Now, obviously, yes, uh, I didn't know what were the challenges at that point when I was actually selling the idea. But when I came back to my studio, I had like a whole bunch of questions that came across and I had to go through each and every one myself and understand how we could find an answer to each one of those questions. One of the parents actually stood there and asked me and say, okay, fine, you know, you will train them, fine. Uh, they will have to come there, but what happens when they come home? How do they learn? I said, they don't have to learn at home. They have to only come to my studio. They have to learn. We will train them and we will make them employable. And this training, you don't have to pay for anything. It's going to be totally funded by us. You don't have to worry about anything. You just have to make sure the person comes to the studio. If he's able to come to the studio and sit in a box and learn, we've got you. It started off with a with a group of five. Because a lot of parents got nervous after that because they could not reach the travel distance from where they live to where the studio is. That was quite long. So that became a challenge. So we started with five. I went again to ADAP. I tried a second time. I got another 20 people on board after that. And then I connected with Enable again and said, look, we did this program way back. Now we want to get started again. So how can you help me? And there came a whole bunch of kids from Enable. You know, these were deaf. 
and we worked with the devs before. So we got a whole bunch of dev kids. I went to Nasio, they came with a whole bunch of kids. So this is what I've been doing, you know, going to NGOs, explaining to them on what is possible and what can be done with different disabilities. Now the hearing and speech work fantastically in visual effects, why? Because it's a visual business. It's nothing to do with hearing, it's got nothing to do with speech. The eyes have to be fantastic. If they can see good visuals, tell good colors, they can create good visuals. And that is where we actually began. And I intend to grow this even further. And let's see how we can collaborate on this. And so that's that's the model that we're running right now. Thanks. Well, coming back to you, uh, Sridhar. You know, uh, we just heard Stephen talking about how it happened. Uh, you know, purely uh, he had that experience in his uh, first uh, place of work and then uh, took that idea with him and incorporated it when he went on to build his organization. But for an organization like Amazon, which operates at a much larger uh, scale, uh, there's obviously some sort of systems in place that uh, goes into making this sustainable, into making inclusion sustainable. If you could tell us how it works. Sure. <coughs> so, uh, I think I touched up on it briefly when I started when I responded to the first question at work. Um, at Amazon, everything is based on uh, mechanisms. So, a mechanism is something where you look at it and say it has three components. Uh, the first one is the tool itself, whatever is the tool, the second one is the uh, adoption of the tool and the third one is the inspection of the tool to make sure it's working. So that's what we use for everything. Um, specifically for this, we have the India leadership team. We went about and identified all the uh, opportunities, all the teams, the jobs, the, the mapping of the jobs and what kind of uh, folks would fit for those particular uh, roles. That's the first one that we do, as always, right? So that team was responsible for the attract and hire uh, figure. <coughs> so we first start to figure out where to go for it and then how to do that. Then once you have brought them in, you have to retain and grow. And finally also have to ensure that you are able to disseminate a culture of inclusion across your organization. You have to do all of this while ensuring that there is physical and uh, infrastructure, uh, sorry, digital accessibility for these people. So you need to have the four uh, pillars uh, strengthened. So we had sponsors for each one of those four pillars from the leadership team. And we identified champions in each of those teams for each of those pillars. So at the end of the day, it's about building a mechanism that will stand the test of time. Make sure that you are roping in all your uh, partners and ensure that you have a good diverse environment for your people to participate in and finally ensuring that every one of those uh, programs or sub-programs has a champion that can take it across within each of those teams. So that's what we do to drive it at scale. Thank you, Sridhar. So, uh, Akul, we just heard about some of the steps, uh, you know, uh, Sridhar mentioned accessibility, etc. And uh, I remember speaking to you some time back where you said that uh, AMAP is also focusing on uh, the ecosystem. If you could highlight some of the steps that uh, you all have been uh, looking at over the last two years. Sure. So, uh, I'll start with an example, right? So. Uh, Last year, we hired our first hearing and speech uh, impaired resource for one of the core engineering jobs. Right? And uh, you know our company works in semiconductor space, uh, which has uh, a lot of IP critical, uh, very uh, high level of engineering, nano level of products. Right? So it's a very precise job. That, that we require at the end uh, to be done. So when we hired that resource, right, uh, we, we now have realized there were quite a few gaps uh, that uh, we needed to work on, right? Like some of the very basic trainings that we start any employer, there were no captions because they were years old, 
uh, every employee goes through that and we never realize that there is there is a requirement for those old and of course the new ones all have captions but over one side so we are now upgrading those uh, second uh, thing is uh, we as i was telling earlier right uh, three way ecosystem is very important we have started working with the uh, universities as well uh, like this year we went to ith kanpur uh, to learn we we are not new college graduate program that's our flagship program for applied materials we go across india for uh, hiring uh, during the uh, placement times uh, so this year we went there that was again a good learning uh, in terms of uh, what are the aspirations how uh, the ecosystem is responding to these opportunities and all of that right and Uh, another thing i would say is on the government part right uh, especially in bangalore uh, we have found that the government is very enthusiastic to support uh, the of the uh, officer there right now uh, is is mata kumar is mata kumar is very interested in partnering in lot of things uh, she is driving this uh, very aggressively and uh, she she has invited us to partner with them on lot of initiatives and uh, other thing that we have learned on the university side is that you you have to go a level higher uh, in the terms that if you go college by college right you will not find that uh, number and that infrastructure right so we have gone a level above uh, to the universities which have like 100 of colleges uh, below them and that's how we we are trying to uh, develop the ecosystem and uh, that's how uh, our upskilling program came into life and with the upskilling program what what we were trying to first do is trying to analyze the ecosystem how other companies are doing it's it's not a new concept right uh, one thing that we learned that we will unlearn from industry is this again should not be just the money game right this should not be just the csr game this should not be just the budget game so what we did different in our upskilling program is this is completely run by applied materials employees we have curated that uh, based on the requirements based on the necessities uh, to fulfill those uh, critical job roles and uh, as i was telling earlier the graduation day was uh, yesterday itself uh, we had 12 candidates both in mechanical and it and uh, very happy that nine are already placed because we didn't commit that we will hire it. but the managers itself after going through the program came and said that okay we want to hire and now we have to stop because our objective of the program was to give something back to industry as well so we are putting it close to hiring that okay our partners are also interested they also want to hire from them uh, we work with a lot of vendor partners who kind of give our contractor workforce for us and they are also very interested in uh, that if you have provided the trainings in the ecosystem you don't find very specialized curated trainings given because it is mostly outsourced that's what we learned so that's something that we are trying to change and we're very happy with the outcome uh, and uh, the consortium right that's that's the third pillar of the ecosystem that i was talking about uh, we are part of a lot of consortiums uh, with cisco vmware microsoft all those companies are coming together they are uh, doing certain programs like train the trainers those kind of things uh, are becoming uh, very helpful because when a lot of these uh, technology driven companies come together right uh, the outcome is always always very favorable because those trained persons can work across the industry so i think these are uh, some of the things and as i was telling earlier the events that also really help with the education the fun part of it right we have done a lot of skits also uh, where employees came and enacted uh, the uh, challenges and uh, lastly i would say what we learned as the biggest thing is there should not be any pity this should not be done out of pity and that's that really defeats the purpose right the ask from pwd candidates is you give me equity right you give me equity and on the performance there should be equality 
So don't do it out of pity, don't do it out of uh, the perception that I can't do it. So these are the kind of things. <laughs>